So tonight we're gonna be shooting three different nebulas in the backyard. So I've actually got to go grab the telescope, so follow along while I go set it up and we'll start talking about what we're gonna be imaging here in just a minute. Okay, so the first item we're gonna shoot with this telescope right here, which is gonna be the Explore Scientific 127 FCD 100 APO Triplet Carbon Fiber Telescope. And we're gonna be looking to the south, which is gonna be in that general direction over there. We're gonna be looking for the Lagoon Nebula. Now, one thing with the Lagoon Nebula, it is a little farther to the south, which has been problematic for me because my house runs east and west. So to actually see southern objects is a little difficult because the house is in the way to the south. So tonight, I've pulled the telescope we're at the very back of the yard and we're gonna try to shoot the lagoon as it goes over the neighbor's house and over my house, ducking behind the trees at roughly 1.10 in the morning. So what exactly is the Lagoon Nebula? It's a star forming cloud of interstellar gas and dust and it's located in the constellation of Sagittarius with an apparent magnitude of six. It's an incredibly bright emission nebula. It's also classified as an H2 region, but we're gonna look at it as an emission nebula, which means star forming region. You can actually see this nebula with the naked eye. You're not gonna be able to make out anywhere near the details that we're going to tonight, but you can absolutely see it, much like you can see the Orion Nebula without the need of a telescope or telescopic lenses for that matter. The Lagoon Nebula is actually located roughly 5,200 light years away from Earth. So relatively speaking, it's pretty close to us. Now granted, a light year we could never travel as human beings, but for the sake of being able to image the entire night sky, that's pretty close considering I'm shooting galaxies in the tens and hundreds of millions of light years away. The Lagoon Nebula is known as M8 or Messier 8. Now this nebula was originally founded in 1654 by an Italian astronomer whose name I know I'm not gonna get right, so I'm not even gonna try it. So there's actually an embedded star in this particular nebula that gives off enormous amounts of ultraviolet radiation, ionizing the gas and causing it to shine. And that's what you see within a nebula is once it becomes ionized, the gas becomes visible and then you can start to see it. Now, if you think my images at the end are incredible, you have to see Hubble's images of the Lagoon Nebula. And soon enough, you're gonna be able to see James Webb's images, which will be even more breathtaking than Hubble's. Within this nebula, we're gonna be shooting hydrogen, oxygen, and sulfur narrowband filters to make sure that we're capturing all of the nebulosity within. Now we're also going to change our exposure times from 600 seconds down to 300 second exposures. And a lot of that's going to be because of the fact it is a magnitude 6 target, which means my images can get really bright really fast if I spend too long with an exposure. At 110, it's going to duck behind the house. Now that becomes a problem because we still have plenty of dark skies up until almost five in the morning now that the days are starting to slowly get longer and longer. So what are we gonna shoot next? The next one is actually a target that I've already spent a little bit of time on and it's gonna be a 
HOO image or hydrogen oxygen oxygen color palette. We're not going to be doing sulfur with this particular one because it's going to be more vibrant with just hydrogen and oxygen. The particular target we're looking at is called Wolf Rayet or WR134. It's in the constellation of Cygnus. It's not far from the Tulip or from the Crescent Nebulas by any stretch of the imagination. It's relatively close to both of those. It's located about 6,000 light years away from Earth. One of the biggest problems we're going to have tonight is called the moon. The moon is incredibly bright. I believe it's over 90% illuminated tonight, which means the effectiveness of our oxygen filter could be decreased substantially even, especially because we're going to be looking to the south and guess what? The moon is going to be to the south. So in many cases, the moon is really cool to image and I do plan to try to start imaging a little bit um, the moon and planets this summer. Um, I need to wait for them to get a little bit higher up in the sky for me, but it actually can ruin narrowband imaging too. For sure it can ruin broadband data, but narrowband can definitely be impacted, especially with high, uh, especially with oxygen three, which is gonna be that ionized oxygen. It can flush our images with too much moonlight to really get much data. <laughs> obviously dark enough we're gonna go ahead and start doing this polar alignment process so what exactly is polar alignment polar alignment is gonna be looking at the star Polaris which is gonna be in the north sky for us in the northern hemisphere if you're in the southern hemisphere there's a different process that everybody there will follow but for us in the northern hemisphere we align our mount to Polaris and the reason why is because the earth doesn't rotate perfectly around it um, on like a 90 degree surface, it's actually tilted. And because of that, we have to use Polaris as the closest object to be in our North Star that allows me to use my mount, which spins, I'm gonna say awkwardly because it's at a 39 degree pitch and it spins perfectly with the orientation of the Earth. So let's go ahead and get this started. So now because I don't have a monitor connected to the computer that drives this entire system, what I rely on is a remote um, service to give me that connection. Now unfortunately with that said, I know other astrophotographers had said what software they use and once that company found out that they were being monetized through these astrophotographers, they actually banned these astrophotographers accounts. So unfortunately, I can't tell you in this video what I'm using, but if you email me at midwest.astro1 at gmail.com, I'll happily tell you what freeware I use to do my connections. So I just started recording on my phone and I'm gonna put it over on the other side here. And what I'm gonna do is go ahead and program Nina to do our three star alignment. So the first thing I'm gonna do is zoom in here on my phone. I'm gonna turn off manual mode. We're gonna go 20 degrees east off. Um, start from current position will be on. We're gonna do two second exposures instead of 10 because otherwise it just it takes way too long we'll bend one by one offset 30 resolve radius so now this is this will be one of the cool things i'm going to show you this flip flat and the fact that i can be inside and completely open it is awesome so what i'm going to do here is i'm going to go to my equipment tab i'm going to go to my flat panel now with the camera let me show you what happens when I press open pretty cool huh it's uh it allows me to do everything that I need to do from inside the house but also keep the lens clean and 
closed when I'm not actually using the system. So, now that that's open, we can go back to imaging. And we're gonna go ahead and press play. It just took its first image. And then here in just a second, it's going to move. So actually, I just remembered, I did mess today with the camera and it might be out of focus. So let's go ahead and switch a filter and focus that filter. Yeah, so when you look at this first image here, it's incredibly out of focus and that's gonna be imperative to making sure that we're properly being aligned to Polaris. It needs to know what stars to look at. So I'm gonna let this run, it shouldn't take too long. Okay, so the autofocus just completed. So now I'm gonna go back to three star polar alignment right here on my phone. I'm controlling everything about this right here on my phone. And now we're gonna press play. And we're gonna see what happens here. You can actually see the telescope moving right now, the mount completely moving. Once it stops, what we'll do is it'll take another exposure. It's then going to plate solve and then it's gonna move once more and it's going to try to align and triangulate and triangulate the amount of change and that way it'll be able to pick up exactly how far off it is with regards to alignment. That's when we'll start making some manual adjustments while this tells us how far left, right, up and down to actually make our adjustments. So you can actually see it's moving again on us already. So it it's able to plate solve, it's able to figure out where it is. We've obviously got to be close enough for it to be able to do these plate solves. I have a general idea of what tree to point this at at a distance. That gets me relatively close within a two to four degree window um, laterally of Polaris. Okay, so now, I don't know if you can see it on this camera, but we can definitely look at it here on the phone. And it's telling us we need to move left two degrees in 14 seconds and now i told you i can get pretty close usually two to four degrees um which is a pretty big window but uh, there's 360 degrees in the sky so to be w even within two is pretty accurate so let's go ahead and make these adjustments okay so the first adjustment we're going to make is going to be let's pitch down so how we do that to come in here and I pull down to until I feel it catch and then I pull up just a little bit to re-lock or re-engage the mechanism within here which you can see the gears right in here. Now that I've done that the software will continuously run a two second loop and solve process so now that I did I need to wait probably um, four to six seconds just to see what changes I've made. good so let's roll with that so once again we're going to park the telescope so let me get the key out of the altitude and store it for overnight storage so the key thing is now to back away from the telescope without touching anything because it is perfectly aligned we are going to tell this to go ahead and go back to its home position and you can see it moving now at this graph you're about to see it's done and now watch this we're gonna move to the side because it's coming for us and this whole rig is about to spin and start pointing in the general vicinity of the moon that's about to ruin my whole night I think as I look at this I think it's about to take a picture of the neighbor's house. I think it's too low. So what it'll do is it's gonna take a picture. Uh, it might either take a picture of a branch or the neighbor's house. We'll have to see here in just a second. 
Okay, so it did make a pretty big adjustment after plate solving. So it looks like the Lagoon Nebula is going to be right over my neighbor's house. You can see the telescope is currently pointed right over there. Except now we're getting our first image. Keep in mind, this is just a 20 second exposure that I'm getting on my phone of the Lagoon and Triffid Nebulas and you can already see an immense amount of detail. We're only doing five minute long, three nanometer HA03 and sulfur two exposures. And you can see an immense amount of detail with just a simple 20 second exposure. Okay, so guiding's going. We're gonna keep an eye on that and make sure that it, um, that it went properly for us. You can actually see we have a really good value of about 0.34 error so far. So as long as it sticks to that or even, as long as it's under one second of error, I'll be completely content with it. Especially because we're only gonna do five minute long exposures to start with and then we're gonna work our way to 10 minute long exposures, but that won't be for a little while yet. And the benefit of those exposures is the nebula which we're looking for in the Wolf Ray at 134 area is actually much more faint. So we need that longer exposure to get a little bit more light to kind of swamp out reed noise, which I won't really get into that now, but just know if you're not an astrophotographer that these cameras have inherent noise that is introduced in every single image. So we have to take multiple images and hours and hours worth of data to swamp out that noise with signal from space. Okay, so the first image is about to come up. I'll put it on your screen, but we can look at it here as it comes up together. As I just watched on my phone, our tracking has been really good at 0.76 error, which I can be completely happy with. So in just three seconds, you're gonna see our first image. And there it is. So I will take multiples of these. Let's go ahead and zoom in and take a look at what we got with that first image. Mm -hmm. 